My name is Amber Lover. My daughter, she is Grace Lover. Two and a half years ago, she, we had a little incident on our farm. The weekend before was home camp, and we spent it with a family, and we had a wonderful time, and the kids really enjoyed it. And the next weekend, it was a Friday. The uh, It was getting close to evening time, and my, my oldest kids, the teenagers, they were 13 and 14 at the time, was outside mowing the grass on some riding mowers. And I was in the house cleaning, and um, my daughter, my oldest daughter ran in. And she told me, she said, Mommy, I'm sorry. <laughs> it does, it really. She said, Mommy, she said, she said, uh, you gotta come quick. She said, Grace has been run over by a riding mower. And I, I said, what? <laughs> you know, you, you don't believe it when someone tells you something. And I said, what? And she said, yeah, she said, you gotta come now. She said, she said, I think they cut off her arm. And I, I ran out the door and I just cried the whole way. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I ran. See, brother, I always get to this part, and I remember. You'll never forget the sounds of your children screaming. I'm sorry. Um, so I got halfway up the hill, and my oldest son, he, he, he I heard him, he was praying. He was real, very loud. He was, Jesus. He said, she's my sister. And I, he seen me coming and he said, mommy, he said, don't even come up. He said, just get the car. He said, we gotta get her to the hospital. And I never stopped. I kept right on running. And I said, no, if it's that bad, we gotta call 911. And I got up there and when I, as soon as I seen her and my children were crying and I wanted to try to calm everyone down, I said, I started sending them to do things. I said, Marion, I forgot my phone. Go get my phone and grab some towels. So I seen right away that her arm, her arm was uh, severed all around the back and it was just hanging in the front. She was laying on the ground. And her, her leg on her backside was, was peeled back. My daughter brought me my phone, and so I called 911 and, and got them on their way. And then I just started talking to her. I was trying to keep her calm while, uh, while we were waiting. And I asked her, I just started talking about home camp from the week before. And I told her, I said, do you remember home camp last week? Do you remember, you know, we did this? And trying to make her smile. And, and then I got to thinking, I've always used music to calm my children when they're scared or when they're sad. So I started, um, I tried to think of a song from camp that she would enjoy and remember. And it was kind of funny, but the only song that came to mind at the time was J-O-Y, joy, joy in the Holy Ghost. So I started singing that to her to try to calm her. It's the only song that would come to my mind at the time. And so I sung that to her and then after a bit I stopped and then I just started talking to her because she kept crying. And she was saying, Mommy, I'm going to die. I said, no. I said, no, you're not going to die. I said, um, I said, you know, I said, do you know in the Bible, it says the angels of the Lord are encamped about those who believe in him. Now, at the time, that's what I said. I know now you know, it says those who fear him. And she said, yes, Mommy, I do. I believe. And I said, well, everything's going to be OK. So the ambulance showed up and my son directed them up to us and uh, they, they took one look and they immediately um, called for a helicopter and uh, they were just trying to get her ready to get on the helicopter. They were cleaning her up and we got back down to the, the ambulance and I realized I didn't even have my shoes on. So I told them, I said, well, let me go get my shoes and my purse. And I, I ran to the house, and in the meantime, I had made phone calls. But now, before you can have that, 
And the way I always tried to think of that, there has to be the right kind of a motive and the right objective. And if your motive is right, your objective is right, and your faith is right, because if you feel that it's the will of God, nothing can keep it from happening. Just think of that. I don't care what it is. If you say to the mountain, be moved, and maybe if you've got to go over the mountain for a purpose, not to say, somebody will say, oh, I'm a great man of faith. I move that mountain. It'll never move. But if there's something over the mountain that you've got to get over there for to do the will of God, you can't get over it, under it, or around it, and yet something in your heart is telling you to go, you speak the word. Don't you doubt. And maybe when you speak the word, only one little grain of sand will fall, but it's on its road. The next day, a spoonful may drop. The next day, a teacup full. You'll never notice it. But if you'll just hold steady, knowing that it's being done, after a while, the whole thing will fall in. That's the way it is by divine healing. When you see the working of the Holy Spirit, the Word laid on, and the Holy Spirit anointing that Word and proving it that He is here in our midst to vindicate Himself and to give to you the promise, then you accept your healing. And my Aunt Jamie, she had made it here. I asked her to come get my child, other children. And uh, she grabbed me quick and she gave me a big hug. And I'm not sure I can remember exactly how she said it, but she gave me a hug and she said, Amber, I forget how she said it, but it was like, just speak it. Whatever it is, just speak it. The man who possesses it, the woman who possesses it, oh, what a blessed person they are. No wonder David said they were blessed. The blessed person. Lay him up on the operating table and take, try to cut the blessing out of him, you'll never find it. It's a hidden power. It's a hidden something. Oh, but it's there. Every man and woman that ever had it knew they got it. No uncertainty about it. Every man that's born to the Spirit of God knows when he's passing death into life. Knows the place, the hour, the minute. When death changed the life. When unbelief of the Bible changed to believe every word of it. When holy, high-minded things passed the humble Christians, they know when death passed the life. Amen. Every man that had it had something different. The world knew it. Every woman had it. Had something different in the world knew it. The world can see it. Your actions prove what you are. You can say you got it, but your actions speak so loud that they can't hear your voice. Your life speaks what you are. And I, I just, I just said, okay. And I brought my shoes and my purse and I ran to the ambulance and they were just trying to, they, they had stopped the bleeding and such by then and were giving her some painkillers. And so I, I leaned down and in my mind I was thinking, okay, what do I want to speak? What, what is my biggest fear for her? So I stuck my head down next to her ear so she could hear me and I just, I was thinking of her arm and I thought she was going to lose it. And I just stuck my ear down and I just said, you will not lose your arm. And I just prayed, Lord Jesus. And the helicopter came and they rushed us into the helicopter. Actually, our neighbors across the field here, it's an Amish group, they opened their, their fencing up so that they could land a helicopter there and take us. And uh, so the flight, they got us to the, uh, Nor the Norton's Children's Hospital in Louisville. And um, as they were rushing us in, they took us to, uh, let's see, it would have been trauma. And they allowed me to stand in the doorway and watch them as they were uh, assessing her and doing everything. And I noticed they brought a man to me. They asked me if I was alone, and I said I was. So they brought this man, and they said his, he was a chaplain and what his name was. And I didn't even think until later, you know, what that could mean. But he was very nice. He talked with me. and. 
got me a drink of water, but they, they allowed me then to come in when they were ready and they were getting her ready for surgery. And I sat with her and um, she, was, she was very sweet. So when she came back from surgery, she was in there for, I believe it was about four hours. And when she came out, she had an orthopedic surgeon for her elbow and the plastic surgeon looking at her leg. The orthopedic surgeon that first day, she originally told us that Grace's elbow, they put, um, I believe it was seven pins in. And, uh, and they said that her elbow would remain fixed, that she would not be able to bend it. They said it would be fixed and they kept reassuring us, she will live a normal life and still be able to do things. And my husband looked at the doctor and he said, he said, no, <laughs> he said, no, he said, no, she will. He said, she'll get her arm movement back. He said, we serve Almighty God and she will get her arm movement back. And uh, so over the course of the week, there was, they would constantly take her back into surgery, do more cleaning, um, moving things and such. And, figuring out what they wanted to do to reconstruct on her leg. It was a pretty large area. They put a wound back on it, on her leg, to um, try to draw the wound a little more closed before they actually did any skin grafts and such. And Grace was very brave through it all. We had um, a sister make a blanket for her that she sewed a prayer cloth into. And every time Grace went into surgery, she would ask us to put the blanket on her with the prayer cloth on her elbow. And uh, they, let, they let her take it. They would always wrap it in plastic and put it under her, belt, her pillow. But she wanted us to play the voice radio the, the whole time. Um, after about a week, we, were, we, were, we weren't sure what was going to happen next. The, the doctors came to us and they wanted to um, the plastic surgeon for her leg, he wanted to do the skin graft, but when he went to do it, she had contracted a C. diff, which is some type of bacteria. It's been two and a half years. It's, it's, yeah, it's like a bacteria, and so they weren't able to do a surgery because of it. And at the time, we were really heartbroken. We wanted to go home, and we weren't sure why it happened. And Was it her left arm or the... It is her right arm. I actually did forget, they, when they told us that she would not be able to remove it, they asked us, is it's her dominant arm? And I said, yes it is. And they said, well she will have to learn how to write with her left arm. And uh, she can write with her right arm. <laughs> but, uh, so they, they had told us that as well at the time. Oh, they said that because her elbow was going to be remained fixed, this is what they told us the first day, that there was a chance her arm would remain stunted, that it would never grow as she got older. She was eight years old at the time. And my husband and I, we actually didn't really talk about that to anybody because we didn't even want to say it out loud. We, we were not claiming that. We, my husband told them every time, I think the doctor, I don't know if we insult her, she was very sweet, but Matt would tell her every time, he'd say, we serve a mighty God. She's going to be completely 100% healed. So the first Sunday after while we were there um, in the hospital. After the service, the tape service, we, were, we had the voice radio playing and Matt took a nap and uh, as Grace did too. So I sat on the couch and I was listening to it and a gentleman came to the door and he was to clean our room for us. And uh, he came in and he was very respectful. He heard the tape going and he stayed quiet. And, but he, I noticed he seemed to move very slow like, he did everything very slowly, and it was almost as though he was lingering to listen. You know, he, he was very slow, and he was just paying attention. And even when he went to mop the floor, I picked my feet up, and I noticed he just moved very slowly. And when he finally got to the door, he stopped, and he stood there for several minutes listening. And then he gave me a smile and waved and left. And the next time we seen him, my husband was awake at the time and talked with him. And he asked us about it, and he said, so you're Christians, and my husband, he, he said, oh yes, you know. So he asked about our daughter and what was wrong, and my husband told him, he said, he said, well, the doctors say this is wrong, but he said, we, we believe in a mighty God. He's, she's 
This poor woman might have had many hindrances, but her faith didn't have any. <laughs> no, you may have a lot of hindrances. Maybe your doctor says it can't happen. But if you've got faith, it don't make any difference what anybody else says. Your faith don't have no hindrance. Your faith sees it. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Abraham called the things which were not as though they were, because God said so. And um, the man, he really appreciated it. He, he stuck his hands up in the air and he said he was a Christian too. And he said, I'm praying for you. <laughs> and he, um, he was a very sweet man while we were there, you know, he, he was there often. But um, before we left the hospital, the final surgery they did before we left, the orthopedic surgeon uh, removed all but two of the pins in her elbow and she came back with the update on that. And she said that, it, she changed it then, and she said that now it wouldn't remain fixed, that she would have about 30% bend in her elbow and that she could bend it 30%. And um, the plastic surgeon on her leg, he, he showed us, we found out the reason why the Lord allowed her to get the C. diff and it took a whole extra week of healing with the wound vac. Um, it closed the wound even more to where her skin graft only needed to be the size of, you know, the, the size of my hand instead of a lot larger. Long more blade cut her leg also. So. Yes, the, uh, the back side of her and into her hip. It, it, yeah, it just, it took the whole top off. They, they, uh, yeah, they, they had to do a whole skin graft and close the area up. So he actually told us at the time, he said that for us to be going home only two weeks after such a horrible accident, he said that was just amazing to him. He said it was like a miracle because he said he, he said most of the time an accident that bad, you'd be in the hospital for months. Uh, we had um, a brother that we was texting things through. Brother Jeremy Evans was. And Sister Princess got my number and she was helping me. I'd send her when I wanted her to send it on prayers and such. And um, Oh, I, I do know that too. When, when we got to the hospital and I told you what I had talked to Grace about up at the scene of the accident, about the angel of the Lord and camped about those. And that was uh, the first message I got from Brother Joseph. He said the angel of the Lord encamped about those who fear him. And I just thought that was really amazing you know that that's what I had that's how I comforted her and then that's what I heard from brother Joseph I believe it was the first message we got from him when she went to leave the hospital we had we had a lot of um, doctors coming in the room from a um, a rehab center is what it was and honestly it was a woman doctor and she was surrounded by a bunch of men I don't know why they came with her, but, but uh, she always did all the talking and honestly, my husband didn't like her. She, he didn't like her and he tried very hard to be respectful, but she kept trying to tell us that Grace would have to go to a rehab center for at least a couple weeks after she left the hospital. And my husband kept, no, no, we're not gonna do that. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, but if it's what the doctors say is needed, you know, then maybe we should. And so I told him we should pray about it, and we did. And um, So we did ask the plastic surgeon after his final surgery if she should go to this rehab center, and he looked so surprised. He's like, well, why? He said, she'll probably be up and running in another week or so. So we took her home, and when we left the hospital, what they gave her was, um, they gave her a, a crutch. I'm trying to remember what it was called. It was like an arm crutch. It came on her arm and had a handle, and she uh, she could barely walk with it when she left the hospital. She couldn't really walk good. And we were a little bit concerned when we left about how we would get her places. And they gave us a wheelchair as well. And when we got home, my kids, they were so happy to see her. And they teased her about being like Tiny Tim. <laughs> she was hobbling around and she couldn't actually go very far. She'd go like 10 steps and be too tired. And so the next day, we got home on a Saturday and the next day was Sunday. And we were preparing for the tape service and all of a sudden one of my kids, they looked at Grace and they said, you know, Grace, I bet you could put that down and you can walk without it. 
And she looked at it and she set it down and she took off running across the kitchen floor. And my husband and I, we were both like, stop. <laughs> you know, we were both like, wait, stop. <laughs> like we finally, we got her to stop and we were like, okay, we're like, we're glad you could do that, but let's let the stitches heal. <laughs> and from that moment on, she didn't need the wheelchair. She didn't need the crutch. And that's only the day after she left the hospital. Um, and she couldn't really even walk in the hospital. They, they couldn't get her to walk halfway across the room. And she, she's been amazing ever since. Every follow-up appointment we'd go in and they would look again. And the plastic surgeon, we haven't seen him in two years because he, he looked at it and he said, it's healed, you don't need me anymore. Um, her elbow, she hasn't been to that uh, surgeon for a little bit, but um, I should get her out to show you how much, if she would, uh, how much she can move it. Now she, uh, she is beyond the 30%. She can do, I'd say she can go from, you know, about there to there. So I'd say she can go at least 50% with her, with her arm. And uh, there's really not much she can't do. She, she, no one can tell by looking at her that she had something like that happen to her. And she can climb trees, she can run. And her biggest obstacle, though, is fixing her own hair. And, you know, she knows that that is her glory. And she, so she's always concerned about it. But she is very stubborn. She does not give up. You know what used to be wrong for Pentecostal women to cut their hair? <laughs> that was her glory. She sure fell short of the glory somewhere. Right. You know, that's the truth, brother. Now, I, that, might as well admit the truth. Now listen, the Bible said it's a woman's glory. So you shared it with the devil. <laughs> That's right. Let your hair grow out. Amen. Dear yeah, lady, you look like a Christian. Quit trying to fashion after the world. The devil gets you in all kinds of trouble. Get that heart. Get into the Shekinah glory over yonder with God. Move in behind the veil and let that drop behind you. Shut the world off where you can't see the things of the world. Die out to self. I remember when I first seen Pentecostal people all around Mishawak, Indiana. Several years ago, women would start shouting at these great big old horn hairpins that fly all over the floor. Brother, you'd have a hard time finding one. You couldn't buy one, I don't guess, anymore. Oh, what a shame. That's right. And used to be that how things was, but they changed. What's the matter? Each denomination tried to build its organization up instead of trying to get the people to God. You know that's the truth. Um, I kept telling her, well, use your left hand. No, she's going to use that right hand and she'll take that brush. And she worked and worked. And um, she is now used to be when she came home and she would try, her hand could only go to here. She could not reach her head. Um, now she's able to brush. She can go to about here now, and she's able to brush it. And I do help her. She is only 11 now, so I do help her with braids and such. But she does her own hair now. Um, she writes with that right hand. The Lord, he was with her all the way. Where do we live? We live in South Boston, Indiana. And... Well, this is where Brother Branham stopped at a little filling station. It's actually right at the end of the road here, um, right across the creek. That is where Brother Branham, Brother Branham stopped and asked for directions. And my kids, they've asked me already, they're like, do you think Brother Joseph ever drove past our house or Brother Branham? Did Brother Branham ever drive past our house? And of course, a lot of it was built on by the Amish, but the original house is from 1957. And I said, well, he might have. <laughs> um, the male family, the male girl. Mm. You know, I'm not sure, but I know that my neighbor, John, that you spoke to, he knew the family, and he said he could almost just about direct us uh, where she lived. It's been a little while since he told me about it. Um, 
I believe he said it was the next road up from Mars and then on up a certain way and because he, he said the barn you know that used to be the direction to get there isn't there anymore I'm not sure yeah yeah well our, our neighbor John he told us that 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 uh, barn is no longer here so it's uh, quite remarkable to have back in the 40s uh, a miracle of the male girl that was crippled and how the Lord in the 2020, 2019, when your daughter had the accident. 2020. 2020. Yeah. So 2020, uh, approximately. 73 or 74, 75 years later, uh, the Lord performed a wonderful miracle in this little uh, tiny village in uh, Indiana. Yeah, yes, he did. And it, it really was. Every doctor that, that seen her uh, after the accident and then two weeks later before she left, and then in the following visits, they all said she was just. They couldn't. They just couldn't understand how she was able to just jump back as fast as she has. She, yeah. We did actually take some pictures. the The following year's home camp, 2021, um, of her doing quiet time during the during the camp, and she actually climbed up in that tree right there, and we we got a picture of her sitting up in that tree with her Bible and all her stuff doing quiet time and that tree and I just thought that was really sweet you know just the year before because the the following year's quiet uh, home camp ended up falling on the exact weekend of the one-year anniversary of her accident and uh, that that made it extra special for us oh it's been it's just been amazing the kids we, we moved up here with all of that in mind. My children went to, have gone to a lot of the different things, the still waters, it's all very special to them. I can see how it's worked on their lives and they seem like they're so much more closer to the Lord than I was as a teenager. Um, they have so much more with the things the encouragements we have through creations with all the the projects they're always putting out and it really keeps our focus more on God than than on our all our daily things that we always do. Can you, uh, tell us about the journey that you Oh yeah, the kids we've been doing that for the past um, oh my god, three years now. We started 2020 when we no longer was having services. Um, we started journaling then and the kids, they enjoy it so much. Well, now we have the stickers, so I print out the stickers, and a lot of my kids are drawers. They like to draw, too, so they journal throughout the tape. Um, I, really, I really love it for my children because I feel like it helps them to stay focused during the tape because they are kids, and I know when I was young, it was hard to keep your mind on what Brother Brandon was saying, especially in the long tapes, the long services, but now they have their journals, and they sit there and they listen for each thing and they're writing it all down and so is this home a tape church? It sure is. <laughs> Except the man be born, and these signs shall follow them that are born. This will all man know you're my disciples and so forth. All right, wanted to do it. Oh what happened? How they were shut up! No revival is gonna happen here. Our denomination won't sponsor such. We'll not have that kind of nonsense among us. I forbid any of you to go to that meeting. Jericho, right in the line of the dam. But there must have been some tape boys slipped in somewhere for the predestinated seed. <laughs> they slipped over to her house and played some tapes. She made her, her own house of a church to receive the message. They still got them, you know. The message got to the predestinated seat anyhow. We don't know how it got there, but it got there. So that the just will not perish with the unjust. God's seen to that today. Yeah. 
some way it slips in. We don't know how, though they won't sponsor it, but there's some seed out there that's predestinated. Anyone knows anything about the Bible knows that that harlot was predestinated. Sure was. She did. The Bible said she perished not with them who believed not. That's right. But she believed the message of the hour.